Welcome to you colleagues and friends who have joined us here today. I'd also like to welcome and thank the Hellenic TV for covering this event and making it accessible to a wider audience. As many of you know, we in the Hellenic Psychiatric Association UK, through our activities, we wish to bring psychiatry to, the, to society, to inform and to help demystify and also destigmatize mental disorders. We welcome suggestions from you for conditions you would like us to cover in the future and we'll do our best to do so. I'll start, as it is the Asclepian oration, I'll just start with a brief word about Asclepius. Asclepios in Greek or Esculapius for those of you who are Latin speakers. According to Greek mythology, Asclepius was the son of Coronis, a mortal, Thnidi, from Thessaly, and his father was the god Apollo. Asclepius was given the gift of healing, and he learned his medical skills from his father. Apollon was known as Apollon the Bear, the healer. He was also tutored in uh, medicine by the centaur hero, a renowned for, who was renowned in ancient times for his medical skills. Asclepius represented the healing part of medicine, and it is not surprising that his daughters had names to do with getting well from illness. Concepts still use, uh, st that we still use today, such as hygieia, health, panacea, panacea, universal therapy, ESO, recovery, and also egli, which means glow, splendor. You may notice the emphasis is on health, in its general meaning, regaining health, but also regaining well-being. Hence, ESO, but also EGLI. The WHO in 1948 made the declaration that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The ancient Greeks had thought of this from Asclepian times, over a thousand years earlier. Asclepius was highly regarded. He was a great doctor and a very successful healer. But unfortunately, he fell foul of hubristic behavior. Very appropriate for our lecture today. His success had the gods worried. And when it was rumored that he had managed to revive a dead man, he had gone too far. He had crossed into the domains of the gods. Mere mortals could not be allowed to interfere with the laws of nature, as dictated by the gods. Outraged with this hubris, or ivris, Zeus threw a thunderbolt and killed him. As ivris, a hubristic behavior was always followed by nemesis, the god's punishment. This is all mythology but it gives us an insight into the norms of the ancient Greek world. Ivris was a basic understanding of the world theory, the cosmotheoria, of the ancient Greeks. When somebody who overestimated his or her abilities and power, physical but mostly political, economic, or military, was behaving with a violent, arrogant, and insulting way towards others, and towards the laws of the city, he or she was considered to have committed Ivris. Some people asked me uh, earlier what Ivris meant. I hope this explains it to some extent. Lord Owen, of course, will go into much more detail about it. Such a person was seen as trying to transcend his mortal nature and attempted to become equal to gods. And of course, this resulted in the gods being insulted and outraged. This hubristic behavior was seen in the ancient Greek world as an infringement of the moral order and an attempt to bring down the social balance and more generally the world order. Hence, the involvement of the gods 
to ensure limits in human behavior. But gods were created by man, but back to Asclepius. Despite the perceived hubristic behavior of Asclepius and his punishment, the gods seemed to mellow after his death, and Asclepius was deified. All over the Greek world, there were sanctuaries named after him, the Asclepia, places where sick people were treated and doctors were trained in the art of medicine, something very much like uh, today's teaching hospitals. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, made his name in one of these, in the Asclepion of the island of Kos. He very wisely, though, stayed away from hubristic behavior, and in his oath, the famous Hippocratic oath, he starts by being respectful to the gods. He says, I swear by Apollo the healer, Asclepios, Igia, and Panakia, and I take to witness all the gods, all the goddesses, he's really playing safe, to keep according to my ability and my judgment the following oath and agreement. And I won't tell you the oath, don't worry. But now it's time to introduce our orator, the Right Honorable Lord Owen. Many of you may not know, but he's also a doctor. Uh, he trained in neurology and he was psychiatric registrar at St. Thomas's Hospital, London, before becoming a research fellow. He then left medicine for politics. He has had a long and illustrious career as a politician. He served in labor governments as Navy Minister, Minister of Health, and Foreign Secretary. He co-founded the Social Democratic Party and was its leader from 1983 to 1990. From 1992 to 1995, Lord Owen served as the European Union peace negotiator in the former Yugoslavia. He now sits as an independent social democrat in the House of Lords. Lord Owen has long been interested in the interrelationship between politics and medicine and has written extensively on the subject. He wrote first the Hubris Syndrome, an acquired personality disorder, question mark, published in Brain, 2009, a prestigious journal, medical journal. In Sickness and in Power, Illness in Heads of Government Since 1900, is a book published first in 2008, and the revised edition 2016, just fresh out of press, is available today for those who wish to acquire a copy, and you could have it signed by Lord Owen himself. He wrote The Hubris Syndrome, Bush, Blair, and the Intoxication of Power in 2012, and Hubris in Leadership, A Peril of Unbridled Intuition, published in Leadership 2013. He is chairman of the charitable organization Daedalus Trust, which is dedicated to raising awareness of the dangers of hubris and of hubris syndrome in public and also in business life. It facilitates and finances research and provides a central repository of academic material on its website. And if anybody is interested, I can let you have their website details later. I'll now hand over to the Right Honourable Lord Owen to deliver the 2016 Asclepian Oration on the subject of hubris titled Toe Holders. Lord Owen. Well, thank you very much. <coughs> And I hope it's uh, clear in the back. And if it drops, tell me, because there's nothing worse than going to a lecture and not hearing it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a number of aspects of hubris syndrome. Uh, I would like to start by saying that um, the Greek language, I think, gives a quality to the word narcissism which is pretty necessary given the overall angst 
to use a German word, about anybody who is called narcissistic. I don't hide from you that I could have called it narcissistic syndrome. But I believe that language, which started with Freud and his classic work on hubris, on narcissism, it is just easier to get people to focus on your Greek word, hubris. And it is different. I don't want to exaggerate the differences between hubris and narcissism. But the more I've read about Greek mythology, the more I've become convinced that the word itself has some special aspects to it which are not, they're covered by, but they're not actually seen publicly as part of the word narcissism. And the biggest difference seems to me to be the aspect of hubris behavior which was most objectionable in Greek mythology, which was the inner contempt for individuals that was often displayed by somebody with hubris. And when you are looking at somebody and trying to analyze whether they are having hubris syndrome, which I'll explain, if you see contempt, then you're almost certainly going to encounter the syndrome. Now, um, there are a number of ways of looking at the explanation of it. And I thought I would show this slide. And I'll leave it up there. I won't read it all out. But this comes from an article in Brain, which was written in 2009. I am by training a neurologist and a neuroscientist. And I was asked by the editor to write this article. And I really felt that I was going beyond my capacity, after all. I haven't done any serious medicine since 1968 when I was banned from being a doctor and minister for the Navy. And it does require a measure of hubris to define a syndrome at about the age of 65 when your medical knowledge is as long since gone. So an American uh, professor of psychiatry at Duke University, um, Jonathan Davidson, wrote a very nice review of what I've been writing about hubris syndrome and the little pamphlet that was put out, well, the little paperback that was put out before the main book on In Sickness and in Power. And I asked him if he would come and write it with me. He said, I don't need to do that. I'll help you. I'll give you every assistance. I said, actually, I do think we need this. And I embarked on a course which I must confess was one of the most enjoyable things I've done in life, which was for six months to write an article entirely using electronic communication, to have the article peer-reviewed by three uh, I assume, distinguished psychologists or psychiatrists chosen by brain, a procedure which, when I was a doctor and I wrote a number of papers with a very distinguished neurologist called David Marsden, didn't exist in the middle of early 60s. And I found, firstly, one person I think was, I wouldn't say hostile, but very critical of the concept and two were very enthusiastic. But their comments, and then their comments again when you responded to their comments, was an extremely enriching and fascinating experience. And eventually it was accepted for publication in Brain, and I still hadn't met Jonathan Davidson. We managed to meet up when I was in America, in, of all places, San Diego, and we had six hours together 
It was, it was like, you must feel, a sort of adopted son who suddenly meets their father, you know. Completely extraordinary experience. So this is joint work, and I would not have been able, as I say, to do it anywhere near as effectively or as knowledgeably if it had it not been for my partnership with uh, Jonathan. And these are the 14 criteria that we <laughs> drew together for a definition of Huber's syndrome. Now what is basically Huber's syndrome? For many, many years, psychiatrists and psychologists thought personality change was something you were, if not exactly born with, something which developed really early in life. And certainly by 18, your personality was pretty fixed. And they were very reluctant to see it in any way different from that. So when we first started seeing discussions in psychiatry about post-traumatic stress disorder, there was a reluctance of the profession to accept it as a diagnosis because it would be an acquired uh, syndrome. And you know it's been written up, of course, a lot in the army and particularly in the light of the uh, appalling stressful circumstances of the Iraq invasion and Afghanistan and slowly what was accepted by the public has now become accepted by the professions that you can have a change of personality that is acquired in obviously post-traumatic stress disorder in circumstances of acute stress like in the uh, field of battle. This was hugely helpful for me when I began to want to argue that people in power could become so intoxicated that their personality was beginning to change. So the profession was on the move, if you like, about acquired personality disorder. Not all of the profession. And in America, where still ana analysts predominate, and analytical viewpoints permeate psychiatry more than in this country or in Europe, there was and still is resistance to accepting uh, acquired personality change. The intoxication of power was a phrase used by Bertrand Russell, and if you have to choose uh, two words which sums up Huber's syndrome, I believe that sums it up. Power seems to produce in some people profound changes and the public understand it. They talk about getting above themselves. They talk about uh, hectoring behaviour, arrogant behaviour, people who know it all people who cease to listen, people who are unable to respond to a dialogue, to a discussion, because they know it all, they've made up their mind, they're fixed. And we see it in all walks of life, in any walk of life where somebody is given authority over others, it might be a primary head, might be a consultant in the hospital, might be a business a chief executive but of course it is very frequently associated with politics and I wrote about it in terms of politics because that was what I knew and one other very great advantage politicians like me we write all about ourselves the whole time they practically all publish autobiographies usually at great length certainly mine was and uh, there is therefore a mine of information, there's endless press comment, they're subject to a good deal of interrogative questioning and answering. And so there is a rich field in which to examine what they are saying and what they are doing. And I now, I must say, talk less and less about politicians and more about business people. But I do think that you have to have a warning. This is not like a clinical medical consultation 
when the person is across the table from you and or around a sofa and you're having an open dialogue between each other. So you have to be careful. You are making assumptions from usually paper and oral records. You are deciphering their intentions through their words and their writing. And it is not one-on-one -on -one personal contact. So that you have to be careful. This whole issue of hubris syndrome came up in writing a book about illness in heads of government, starting with Theodore Roosevelt. And of course it became very obvious that many of these heads of government have hubristic personalities. I am hubristic myself. So there's some advantage in this. It takes one to know one. But of course it also means that you enter into this process and dialogue with certain prejudices uh, before you even start. But I think it was because I was fascinated by what the impact of power on myself uh, and watching it then in many other people at pretty close quarters that I began to think this was important. And the more I looked into the decision making of political leaders, the more I thought there was a serious aspect to it which deserved to be called a syndrome in as much as what is a syndrome. Signs, symptoms that are more commonly found together than separately. That's all it really means. Now initially I started writing because I was in the framework of illness of heads of government to think of it probably a little too much as a disorder or medically. And that again has shifted over time. I've become to more aware that if you're going to analyze this carefully and we're going to do something about it, it's better to see hubris syndrome as only one aspect of a medical one and that it needs to be studied in the round. And the Daedalus Trust, which uh, we established together, some of us, and one of them is Professor Boras, who's here, Nick Boras, who's here in the room with me. Now this is the Daedalus Trust. And what we are trying here to do is to be as multidisciplinary as we can, to only have medicine as one aspect, to respect philosophy, psychology, even anthropology, and to try and look at it in the round. And that's underway now, and we have a distinguished group of trustees, and we are always lacking really enough money, but we have got some money to back research projects, and what we've tried to do is to use it as uh, seed corn psychiatry. Hubris syndrome is an acquired personality change in someone who is normal, in inverted commas, in the sense of having been elected or chosen from a position of power through an open procedure and examination like a chief executive of a company or of a charity and has hitherto shown no evidence of being intoxicated by power and with no previous psychiatric history. So we deliberately did not include anybody who could have bipolar disorder. And again, the limitation was this. You weren't seeing them in a clinical setting. You were making the diagnosis on words and paper. And I think we were careful about that, and I think actually some advantages that we did not... Because people like Lyndon Johnson, for example, is thought by American psychiatrists to definitely have had bipolar. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt is thought by... Uh, American psychiatrists to have had bipolar. And um, Franklin Roosevelt, I'm as sure as I can be that I do not think had hyperhubris syndrome. Many people believe that uh, Winston Churchill uh, was bipolar. Personally, I don't think so. And here you come again historically. Do you judge people 
by what would be thought to be bipolar when they're alive, or do you say they have bipolar because of modern attitudes? And here again, there's a distinction across the Atlantic. Bipolar disorder seems to be used much more frequently in America. It's seen as a spectrum illness, and you could put the label on, even though it may be just an up and down mood change, which others would not call, use the word bipolar for. Anyhow, we tend to exclude it. If there's any influence, we don't use the term hubris. Now, if hubris syndrome is acquired, then it ought to change when you're no longer in power. If power is the driving force, take power away, and you would expect to find at least in some cases. Now, there are two very interesting people to look at this, because I was writing this during the uh, Iraq war, and I think correctly, but others may disagree, diagnosed the change in personality, which I certainly saw for myself on a one-on-one -on -one basis with Blair, and from a distance with George W. Bush. I think that you could almost say that George W. Bush's change in personality came with the shocking news. And for a president of the United States, the deeply shocking news. First one tower has locked down, and then if some short time later, you're told the second tower, by which time you know America is under attack for the first time since Pearl Harbor, and Hawaii was a long way away, and New York was its financial capital and largest city. And you see in watching that television of him sitting in a primary school in Florida and being told first to go on and then the second, on his face there is stress plus plus. Now the interesting thing about George Bush is that in retirement he seems to be very different from eight years in, as president. And indeed, in his first few months, he's fairly laid back, relaxed guy, doesn't seem to have a great deal of attention, uh, doesn't actually take some of the CIA reports about Al-Qaeda that seriously. But in retirement, he doesn't seem to want to go on television in. He has written a biography, which is actually uh, very open, quite adamant that he misjudged of the situation in Iraq and didn't put enough troops in for the aftermath. It takes the blame himself, doesn't find a lot of scapegoats, and writes um, quite an attractive way. Whereas Tony Blair is completely different. Out of power, but chasing power. Endlessly having to create uh, private airplanes, wealth, influence, and unable, really, in his autobiography, to make any real apology or any real recognition that he and he also did not find enough troops for the difficult part of the aftermath, and hanging on to the semblance of power, not really seemingly to have changed at all. Now, I may be a bit unfair, but certainly that was my impression, having to go through the horrible issue of reading many, many of these people's biographies who were involved in the Iraq war. Uh, so I do think, broadly speaking, on this very limited sample, that this syndrome can be both acquired and can be lost. And that the connection with power is a factor, but not by any means the only factor. So this is really what lies behind this whole concept. Now, I think it's become important for many reasons. But you cannot look at the financial crisis that hit the world in 2009 and the personalities of the major banks in Wall Street and in London and the people most heavily involved without seeing hubris syndrome writ large over the characters who were taking key decisions. And Again, it's not easy because they're even tighter and more difficult than politicians about getting them on record. 
and it's not been easy to uh, establish it. But gradually, if you look through the financial journals, the sort of interviews these people have been giving over the years, you can build up a picture in which it's not hard to see hubris syndrome in many of these key figures. If you look at the banks, the amount of money that they spend on risk assessment, creating models, analyzing decision making, the staggering thing is how little they were prepared to look at the biological factors that are changing personalities under the stress of banking crises. Fortunately, there are people, one of whom is on the John Coates, who's one of the trustees of the Daedalus Trust, who are doing extensive research with uh, neuroendocrinologists and others, looking at uh, many of the chemicals in the brain. Dopamine is clearly <coughs> an extremely important one. Adrenaline is another one. And testosterone is another. And we're beginning to build up now a picture where hormonal changes, neurotransmitter uh, changes, are clearly having some influence. And of course the best people to go to is the typical London East End trader on the stock market or in any call situation. These characters I mean, they'll give blood with the testosterone test, urine with the testosterone test, any time you ask them. They're uh, bullion characters. They think it's all a great joke. And they're wonderful uh, as a test bed for this sort of stuff. But of course, it has to be admitted, they're not making key decisions in some respects, in the sense that how you think of what a president or a prime minister make. But they are making decisions which affect many people's purse and involve large sums of money and they're making these decisions quickly uh, in instant seconds, switching money resources around and have profound consequences. So we're beginning to build up picture in this whole area and I personally think it's still in its infancy. I mean, I remember when I was working with David Marsden, a neurologist, he had managed to get hold of one of the first samples of dopamine went on to be used in extensively in Parkinson's research. And we still don't know anywhere near enough about it. So we pursue in the Daedalus Trust this type of research as well. We're building up that neuroscientific side of all this as well. Now, there's another issue which I would like to think of. We've been focusing here mainly on individual hubris. We're using the language that people, the acts. One of the new sciences, and we have on this uh, Dr. Peter Garrett, who's one of our trustees, did a very interesting survey. They analyzed every word spoken by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, by Prime Minister John Major, and by Prime Minister Tony Blair, at questions and answers to the Prime Minister. And the focus is, of course, not on the first answer to the written question or to the oral question, but it's the subsequent debate where they are much more likely to use wording, if you like, naturally, coming up what they really think. I will not surprise you by the results. They are quite clear-cut that hubristic words are used massively by Blair, secondly, quite a lot by Margaret Thatcher, and barely any at all by John Major. So it validates what we'd all think, having listened and heard and watched the personalities. But it is quite interesting. And this is a very interesting new science now. Uh, Iris Murdoch's novels have been analysed for their wording and they're beginning to realise that you can use this as a technique for diagnosing early Alzheimer's because of the poverty of the wording as Alzheimer feeds in. And whereas in the, her early novels, Iris Murdoch is using uh, many different words with a wide vocabulary and 
a fascinating use and juxtapositions of words. And as Alzheimer's starts to build in, the wording becomes more monotonous, less varied, and often not even really fully coherent. So that's another tool we have at looking into the brain, analyzing hubris, analyzing attitudes, and at analyzing personality. But perhaps the other and potentially most dangerous of all forms of hubris may be what we call corporate hubris. And here we have a very interesting saga in front of ourselves. British Petroleum is, uh, as it used to be called, um, now BP, uh, our largest oil company, our most successful company over many decades. And I think they are a classic sign of corporate hubris. And the place where it manifested itself was over safety expenditure in relation to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in April 2010. On the 31st of August 2012, the US Department of Justice filed papers in the federal court in New Orleans blaming BP PLC for the Gulf oil spill, described the spill as an example of gross negligence and willful misconduct, said about the failure to rerun a negative pressure test when the first test revealed a pressure anomaly from the well, that such a simple yet fundamental and safety critical test could have been so stunningly, blindingly botched in so many ways by so many people demonstrates gross negligence. The case cited a culture of corporate recklessness. This word recklessness is often heard and seen in people with hubris. A recklessness of decision making. And they, the first phase of the trial began in 2013 to determine liability. The second phase was in uh, later in 2013 focused on how much oil had been spilled. And the third phase was the settlement, January 2015. In July of 2015, BP agreed to pay over 18 years to five states. 18.7 billion pound settlement to be used for Clean Water Act penalties and various claims. It was the largest environmental fine in US history for a Gulf oil spill. And as we begin to try to get at the decision making in BP, which was not difficult, uh, and sorry, not easy, very difficult, and the huge cover up in private industry, and very difficult to get any facts out, and they say very little. Hayward, who was then the chief executive, got a lot of the blame, but more and more focus has appeared on Lord Brown. And he went through a rather unfortunate legal case, uh, which I don't need to go into in great depth. But in that, he was guilty of contempt of court. And you see this word contempt coming up. And because it's in a court case, you could say things and repeat things, which would normally be really limited by libel. I've never sued anyone in my life. I believe politicians shouldn't sue. But I do believe politicians also must have the bravery to comment about behavior and risk the fact they may have to take libel, but not to take it on the floor of the house and use, in my view, an unfair way of um, hiding behind criticism. But we have got to get at this type of decision making. The argument used by the claimants against BP was that safety was constantly cut back in order to keep profits high and that they did not take the lessons of the Alaska and other earlier oil industries and this is held very strongly by uh, Amoco which was taken over by BP and who an American company that felt that they had taken safety seriously and watched safety being cut back by BP over a period of years. 
In my view, it's an absolutely outrageous that we in this country have neglected the whole thing, boosted the BP chief executives, never called them to question in any way except for, I will say this, the chairman of BP, who did see the dangers of science and did refuse to appoint Lord Brown, reappoint him, but had a huge battle in the uh, board of that company. Now I say all this because I have become now much more interested in corporate hubris as it affects political institutions. Uh, I thought long and hard about whether to talk about this here in Greece, uh, here to Greek audience. I'm a, I have a house in Greece. I, I love it. I love Greece. I've loved it, Greece ever since I was 16 and was in the chorus of Antigone in Bradfield College open air Greek at theatre. I can't speak a word of your language and I'm deeply humiliated. I get better by November. I leave and close the house up until Easter and Easter comes and I can't remember a single word. I'm fortified in thinking that this is not Alzheimer's coming tomorrow by the fact that my delightful wife has exactly the same problem. But there is, it is damned hard to learn Greek, I think, in the best of times. But beyond 60, starting fresh is a tough one. And we have not mastered it. And I'm very sad about that. But I watched and lived with Greece. I went to, down to an economist conference when your country was thinking of joining the Eurozone. And I begged you in this very large grouping of business people in Athens not to do it. Okay, you didn't take my advice. You won't be the first or the last people to do that. And I don't hold it against you. And I don't speak about politics very much in Greece. But those who know me think you should never have joined and that you should get out. However, I say nothing. But I speak now on this subject because I have this decision and have made this decision in my own country. And I'm speaking here for the deepest of reasons and certainly more in sorrow than in anger, I have decided that I believe it's in Britain's interest to get out of the European Union. And I can tell you I never thought I would ever say that. I supported it as a candidate in 1962, but I was never a Federalist. I was a real Gatesgalite, who was the first senior politician to warn that the project was really aimed at creating a country called Europe. But because of General de Gaulle, who had just been involved before we made our first application in 62, which he rejected, twice he rejected us, probably for quite good reason. Uh, in the sense he understood we were not going to become part of a country called Europe. But nor was to go. But Adna very carefully and very cleverly allowed to go to pull back from the Monet project of a federal Europe. And he valued keeping France and building up the French-German relationship so much. So I have been a European all these years, but never a Federalist. I believe politics is the art of the possible, and I think that politics evolves, like medicine, and it's very hard to say never. And when the Eurozone project came about, I formed an all-party group in this country to ensure that we did not join it even though we had an opt-out ourselves. Because I sensed that in 2003, had Tony Blair had a victory in Iraq on the back of a so-called Baghdad bounce in the opinion polls, we would have been asked to join the Euro. And I believe that Gordon Brown would have gone along with it, to be frank. So we formed a grouping, a New Europe, and a business for steering, and we tried to see how we could check it. And that's when I first encountered this corporate hubris. You could not go to any major 
company in that period of time, 2001, 2002, without having your ear bent by the fact that we should join the euro. And the profound consequences for us, it started from the Maastricht Treaty in 1990, where all this, in my view, began. And for a long time, it was very difficult to get any hearing for a contrary view in the Financial Times. And what they build up is an atmosphere like we see in some other aspects of public life, and one of them is of immigration, where it becomes very difficult unless you are very courageous and very intelligently informed about the subject, like economics, to be swamped out of any discussion. If you like, the zeitgeist is you've got to believe that the Eurozone is fine despite the fact that there were identifiable flaws in the design of the Eurozone, which were spotted by the Bundesbank right from the start. They were dragged reluctantly into the uh, creation of the Euro by German politicians. One in particular I have huge admiration for him and uh, think was a great figure, Helmut Schmidt. But Kohl also had it. And um, if you think about it, Mitron became accepted in this. It was won by less than a quarter of a percent the uh, referendum after the Maastricht Treaty in France to endure the Eurozone. There's been deep skepticism in the body politic of this project at all levels because people have a great sense of feel on these things. They spotted the problem with the project. That you can't have a currency without a country. The two go together. Now of course the people who want a country, who want a federal Europe, have been the most advocate, the strongest advocates of the Eurozone. And so we sweep people up in this sort of corporate hubris that the way forward is to give up the states, the Westphalian settlements, and to grow together in a new world of countries which become one in a project called Europe. I was swept up in it. I openly admit. I always said I wasn't a federalist. But I kept saying to myself, I'm an evolutionist. Maybe what you can accept now, or not accept now, you could accept in 20 years time or 30 years time. Maybe my, my generation is going to have to live with it. Uh, youngsters are going to have to live with it. Now it's not, it doesn't fill all the criteria of hubris that we were there. But hubris is a deep seated part of this global feeling that starts to go that you can create something which has never been created before. There have been experiments with currencies. They've all failed. They've either ended up with a country or they failed. And it goes back, you know, right to European, mid-European mid history. Um, Charlemagne, there was a common currency. It seemed to be a great success and then it miserably failed. America started out with a dream of a common currency. It took something like 150 years for a country that was set up with one constitution and one language to gradually build up a capacity to have one single currency. They had dollars, but differently priced dollars in different states for decades. And I asked myself, how can it be that a whole continent can be gripped by this sort of thing. And it's still an argument. I mean, I don't want to present to you, it's, there are people who will say you can have a currency without a country. I say fine, but you can't have a currency that works without a fiscal transfer union. And it's of course this is the issue which Eurozone cannot make up its mind. I have watched what your country has gone through. 
I have watched the unemployment in Spain. 56% for people under the 25 at various times in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, in Greece. And it hasn't just gone on for a year or two. It's gone on for three, four, five years. I think it's intolerable. We're told we need austerity. Well, we probably do need some austerity. But we also need fiscal transfers. The IMF has told us quite clearly that this Eurozone cannot work without this. And yet that zeitgeist sweeps this aside. So we in this country now have to make our own minds up. Greece will make its own mind up. You already had your referendum once, twice. Uh, I respect it. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But all I can tell you is one of the reasons that I've come out against Britain is I believe it's our last opportunity to stop being pushed relentlessly and endlessly towards, even though we are outside the Eurozone, towards having to live with the reality that to save the Eurozone it has got to have most of the characteristics of a single country. We won't be in it, but once you look at the Eurozone area with its large element in the European Union, then you come to the whole question that the Prime Minister looked at of his renegotiation. And it became essential for Britain that doesn't want to, and I, that is a pretty solid view of the public, to be a member of a single country. You have to have a design which allows for those countries that are not going to be part of the Eurozone. Well, here we'll have difference of opinion, and I'm not going to prejudge that you will make your mind up whether or not what the Prime Minister brought back is sufficient to be a check. But you cannot look at any aspect of Europe the same once we went through in 1990 trying to convince ourselves that we could create a Euro, we could create a Eurozone, and we could do so without it being a country and without fiscal transfer unions. Now what are fiscal transfer unions? That's what we think is commonplace in everyday economic decision making in this country. For decades we have put money to Scotland because their economy is weaker. For decades we pushed money into Wales, into Northern Ireland and into some aspects of Cornwall and in some aspects of East Anglia. And we do it because we are citizens of one country and London by and large is the, pay, pay, uh, the people who pay for it. And they do it in reasonably good spirits. They live a pretty high standard of life, higher than most of the rest of the country. And they don't object very strongly to money being transferred out from the London earnings, if you like, to the peripheral part of the United Kingdom. And I think this is the issue that we face. And so, I ask myself, what drives it? What is, what is this? Well, being European. And then I look at what's happening in Greece. Some of you may or may not read the Herald Tribune. When I ceased to be Foreign Secretary, I was always a great friend of Dennis Healy, although we used to have some fairly violent rows in public. It may have met made you wonder whether we were friends. But we were friends. And one day I said to Dennis, why are you so well informed, Dennis? I, I feel I'm out of power, I don't get this. He said, the Herald Tribune, the Herald Tribune, as it was then called. And blame you down, I started to read it regularly, and I soon began to feel I was missing nothing from the briefings of the Foreign Office. It was all in this newspaper. And I began to be rather better informed, rather more like Dennis Healy. And today's New York Times has a devastating one page, front page, short story, but whole page describing what is happening in the camps up 
on the border of the former Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia. <laughs> Having spent three years trying to get you Greeks to find an acceptable word, I will live with the wording I left you with because I failed to get you to agree. But you can make a joke about what's happening on the Macedonian border, but I believe me, it is a horrendous, horrendous problem. And are Greece going to have added to all your oil problems this issue to resolve? And I fear you are. We've had a settlement today in Brussels of sorts, but I very much doubt whether it will really settle the issue. I think uh, we will take some from uh, camps in Turkey, direct, in exchange one for one, for people who you return from Greece. And money will pass, and usually that money will get into the wrong hands. I don't want to sound a Jonah about it, but I see no real prospect of it being very viable. And more and more, I think you are seeing what is happening in Greece today. Buildings that are not being fully utilized are being found for migrants. And gradually we're building them up, some wisely trying to spread them around Greece in the center, under populated areas. But even the Olympic uh, Stadium thing I see is being used in Athens. And I think you will get through your most immediate financial or third financial draft. There will be transfer payments, probably not very much revealed, but Germany is ready to pay all this amount of money to Turkey, is certainly also ready to pay a lot of money for it. But it will not be money that will leave its legacy. It will be a very profound change added on top of all your other problems. And I must say I worry about it. And then I hear my British Prime Minister saying, well, we've got nothing to do with us because we're not in Schengen. And I say to myself, has it come to this, that this country with its proud reputation and tradition of taking people in with asylum over many, many centuries can literally say it's nothing to do with us? Firstly, it has a hell of a lot to do with us. I mean, basically, we've also agreed that Turkey will come into the European Union very much quicker. Yet we'd all agreed that that was not going to happen. And Turkey broadly accepted it wasn't going to happen. I gathered tonight we were going to have somebody from Cyprus. The Cyprus president was warned that he had to accept things which he, rightly in my view, saw as deeply damaging to the slow but steady progress that really seems to have at long last been made over Cyprus. I'm glad he rejected it. And that does not appear in the agreement. But again, I ask myself, how do you cope with a zeitgeist? How do you deal with an overwhelming body of opinion that seems to want to sweep aside fact after fact, presence after presence? Mr. Obama, President Obama, who I am probably one of the greatest supporters, is coming to this country to tell us how to vote. Very ill-advised, in my view. But what has he been doing over the Greek financial situation? In fairness, he has sent his Treasury ministers in ever since 2010, every single year, to try to persuade the EU countries, and particularly the Eurozone countries, to change their policy to the Euro. Nothing has been done. Britain has done exactly the same. I went to Berlin six four weeks ago. I left with a very strong view that there will be no change to the Eurozone for at least to 2023, possibly 2025, and maybe even longer. It seems that the EU has become so dysfunctional, it cannot even grapple with the reform of the Eurozone that it is required. I know you in Greece have not behaved wonderfully well. I know Goldman Sachs did a disgraceful uh, deal with your government called a scandal by uh, Angela Merkel and scandal in many ways it was but it's equally scandalous that there's no transfer union to help Greece deal with the problems and four or five other countries in the Eurozone as well and before we look at all this 
what supreme crash arrogance to have Goldman Sachs giving us lectures in this country about what we should do or not do about the European Union when this vast sum of money went into helping Greece in inverted commas in 2001 which by 2005 uh, was completely instead of being a gain was a serious net asset a net deficit and contributed greatly to your deficit so I end on this note because I think it is related to hubris I think it is related to this whole question of what happens in a democracy here in your country the country of all in the whole world that it can be genuinely said is the start of democracy what are we seeing a deep-seated reaction particularly of the young but not only to the way we are governed what are we seeing in America a deep-seated reaction which journalists often say they don't understand uh, and we're seeing it all over the world the elite have governed insensitively and been unable to carry with them the demos, the population which they require for votes we have given a degree of uh, priority to and weight to their opinions of the banking and the financial community in all our countries which is quite undemocratic and quite wrong and foolishly accepted advice which has proven to be wrong and still we go on doing it. the last governor of the Bank of England has written a very good book it has in its title alchemy it doesn't tell you how to vote rather wisely he's avoided that which I wish his present one had done but he tells you this eurozone crisis is going to go on he warns us that the world economy is nowhere near as serious uh, as stable as people are claiming it's a very salutary account more in theory and more in sorrow than in anger it's a fine book and we're going to have to start to grapple with those warnings all over again but underneath it all what do we do about hubris initially I was going to talk to you about toeholders toeholders is a term that came from Lewis Howe who was the man who meant the most to Franklin Roosevelt who he worked with before he developed polio and with his wife and his secretary Missy Lahan these three enabled Roosevelt to become president of the United States and one of I think the great figures of the 20th century and Roosevelt was hubristic but he had this capacity to put around him people who would be unafraid and constantly encouraged to criticize him how called him Franklin the only person in the White House to call him Franklin to his face but if you bathe somebody you have dealt with double incontinence in a remote part of Newfoundland and saved somebody's life there is an intimacy in your relationship which is powerful but toeholders are very interesting people and they're not always men and Roosevelt's wife Eleanor was also a very important toeholder those who are susceptible to it those who lead should try as much as they can to have people around them who can challenge their prejudices who can question their decisions can make them rethink attitudes and formulate new policies in the light of new evidence I'd just like to finish by reading you a letter from another toeholder and she was writing in the 27th of June 1940 probably at the moment of maximum peril for this country and it starts my darling 
and it's written by Winston Churchill's wife. I hope you will forgive me if I tell you something I feel you ought to know. One of the men in your entourage, a devoted friend, has been to me and told me that there is a danger of your being genuinely disliked by your colleagues and subordinates because of your rough, sarcastic and overbearing manner. It seems your private secretaries have agreed to behave like schoolboys and take what's coming to them and then escape out of your presence, shrugging their shoulders. Higher up, if an idea is suggested, say at a conference, you are supposed to be so contemptuous that presently no ideas, good or bad, will be forthcoming. I was astonished and upset because in all these years I have been accustomed to all those who have worked with and under you, loving you. I said this, I was told, no doubt it's the strain. My darling Winston, I must confess that I have noticed a deterioration in your manner and you are not as kind as you used to be. And it ends up, please forgive your loving, devoted and watchful Clemmy, a drawing of a cat, and P.S. I wrote this at Chequers last Sunday, tore it up, but here it is now. I think this is a fine example of how human relations can change human behaviour. How behaviour is not a constant. How contempt can come to all of us. How hubris can gather in an individual and in a company. How hubris can gather not just in one country, but in a union. How people can pretend that things are what they are not and confuse people and not live with realism and with truth. So I believe myself, as we come to make our decision in this country, and I've trespassed a, more than a little on your uh, time and patience in telling you of my decision, I will respect your decision. And I say this, this is a once in a lifetime chance. Don't let us get into the habit of being a Swiss country in which we have plebiscites every fortnight or every year. And don't let Scotland get away with this either. Scotland knew because the Prime Minister announced his decision about a referendum in 2013. That's a year before they had their referendum. Their referendum too was a once in a lifetime. I want to hear from this Prime Minister and very soon that he has no intention whatever of allowing another referendum in Scotland until some meaningful number of years. Once in a lifetime, 25 years. Remember the last one we had on Europe was in 1975. But it's certainly 50 years. And I will not have the people of this country browbitten into taking a decision for all of us on a UK basis on the argument that there'll be another referendum in Scotland. Because it's pure nonsense. If it's not agreed, and made legal, as the last one was, by we in this country agreeing to abide by it, there isn't a prayer that any European country, it's very unlikely that Spain under any circumstances, or Belgium, will accept any country that separates off. And it's an illusion to make the choices on these sort of uh, issues. These, if you take referendum, you do it because the politicians have failed. That's what happens. It happened to Labour in 1975. I was a member of that government. We couldn't make division decisions on Europe. We were so divided. That's why we put it, as we promised, in the 74 referendum, um, general election to a referendum. The Conservatives have done exactly the same. But you then have to respect. You're telling members of Parliament they have to carry into law what they themselves may be against. You're suspending parliamentary democracy. Fortunately, in this situation, we're not doing it at a time of general election. We tell the country and the government and the Prime Minister the direction of travel. Do we want to stay, remain in the European Union? Do we want to leave? They then carry out the negotiations. That's done by the government. And I thank for the fact that there's a four-year period before an election in which that transition can be conducted. So watch it very carefully, these politicians. You don't call referendums just to get the government's policy through in another way. You have chosen a different mechanism. You've let the people make their choice. And they must make that choice on a balance of advantage. Don't preempt it 
before you start by saying there is no choice, there is a choice, or there oughtn't to be a referendum. It's as simple as that. If it is such an obvious issue, so definitely weighted, so disadvantageous, such a threat to our security, then you should have pulled back on the whole issue and not hold it and not do it even now. So we live in a very difficult period of history. You taught us in Greece the abiding nature and the vital necessity of a demos, a, de a, demos, a democracy, a dialogue, a debate, decisions. Don't let us forget it. Neither now, in the next few months, nor in the next few years, nor in the next few centuries. And make our choices carefully. We don't need to be told by the Queen again. Think hard about the matter. Uh, but it's been an opportunity for me to say some deeper things than perhaps I should have said. But all decision making, all wisdom comes from learning and from experience and having the systematic openness to examine structures and I hope that's what we're trying to do with the Deadless Trust, to open up minds on how we govern ourselves, how we see ourselves and what checks and balances we need in a democratic system so that we can make wiser decisions for the future. Thank you. I will put it up in my house and <laughs>